Hi, I'm Nancy Wilhelms, and I'm the executive director of Anderson Ranch, and I'm really glad that you're here today. We have an outstanding summer series in progress. This is the second talk, and we are sharing lots of conversation, dialogue, and ideas about contemporary art. I'd like to thank our series sponsors who make the series possible. First, Sharon and John Hoffman for sponsoring Hank Willis Thomas today. Thank you, Sharon and John. I'd also like to thank Aspen Magazine, AXA Art Americas, Harmon International, Kate Solomon, and David Wasserman on behalf of the Weston Snowmass Resort and the Holiday Inn Express Wildwood Snowmass and Valley Valet. So thank you, sponsors. Okay. Hank Willis Thomas is a conceptual artist who practices in many media, and he explores the issues of identity, race, and culture. I first met Hank via his Truth Booth in Miami at Art Basel last December. I didn't really meet Hank. I stood in a long, long line, and I entered the booth, and I sat down in front of a big lens, and I pressed a button, and I had two minutes to reveal my truth. Well, I have a new truth that I have just learned this week, and the truth is that Hank Willis Thomas is an absolutely delightful human being. <laughs> Hank is represented by Jack Shaman Gallery in New York. His work is also in numerous public collections, including the Museum of Modern Art, the Whitney Museum of American Art, and the Brooklyn Museum. Please welcome Hank Willis Thomas. Hello, everyone. It's uh, great to be here. H Hello, everyone. <laughs> Um, I am many things, but I am not a great editor. So, uh, and being here, it's, it's exciting because there's so many people who I've known for so long, and I want to especially thank Sharon and John Hoffman for inviting me to, to be here. And um, I hate to be redundant, and someone, a few people here have seen me speak in the past year. How many people have seen me speak in the past year? Okay, not, not as many as I feared. Good. <laughs> so, but I, I, I really love to start with a excerpt from a piece that I did called A Person is More Important Than Anything Else, uh, based around the, the, the speeches primarily of James Baldwin, but bringing him in a context of pr the present day. But, but I'm just gonna show you the very uh, first minute and a half. It seems to me that the artist struggle for his integrity must be considered as a metaphor for the struggle which is universal and daily of all human beings on the face of this terrifying globe to get to become human beings. What we might get at this evening if we are lucky if the mic doesn't fail, if my voice holds out, if you ask me questions, is what the importance of this effort is. When I first heard that statement, and you can see that it's, it's also blending with uh, images of an artist's kind of pursuit is basically akin to the pursuit of all of us to be a human being, it really struck me in my heart because I do think, and thank you so much for saying that I'm a delightful human being, my mother would love to hear that. Um, but I realized that that's basically what I'm trying to do, is trying to be a better person every day. And I think I try to do that through the conversations and the relationships I have, but also through the things I learn. And I, I've learned things through a variety of ways and I've started to express myself in a variety of ways. And this book, the Sweet Fly Paper of Life is probably the origin of my art career my, and maybe uh, my life as I know it because uh, this woman found that book, which was a, a 
combination of photographs by Roy de Carava and text by Langston Hughes, uh, which featured images of African Americans, which were very much in stark contrast to most of the images that she'd seen um, up until that day. And that sent her on a journey, which sent me on a journey. <laughs> Um, and the journey w actually kind of began in, in college, where I'll, I know there's a lot of people here in college. I wanted to think about how artists today who are working things today might be working on the same thing later and also pass that on to future generations. But my mother um, hadn't found enough viable kind of uh, academic work about African Americans impact in photography. And so she wrote a research paper and she said, I, I, uh, like to focus on the black's contribution to photography from 1840 to 1940. And she lists 10 photographers, and she wrote, talks about how uh, she's written so many letters, and she's gotten kind of enthusiastic response, but scant kind of information. And I found that, and I was so amazed, because 10 years after writing that, she published her first book, Black Photographers, 1840 to 1940. And what's amazing about that is when we think about the United States in 1840, and the stories were told about the African-American experience, it's hard for us to even imagine what it means that a person of African descent before the abolition of slavery could be on the cutting edge of technology using not only um, science, physics, um, chemistry, um, and also creativity. And, and thinking about th that origin really helps me to re understand that History is not always what it seems. And so this book became her first book, but which led to another book, 1840 to 1940 to 1988, which led to other books, and more 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 books, and more, and more, and more. And I cut some out just to save some time. <laughs> But what, what, what really is so fascinating is, as someone said, that an art, every artist is um, kind of in pursuit of their own deep question. And I realized that the question that I am in pursuit of is, how are the frames that we are given about ourselves, about the world, and about our history, how do they affect the way we understand the truth and reality? And I went back into my archives, and there's one person here, Miles Thomas, from, who is an alumni of my high school, Duke Ellington School of the Arts in DC. Um, and when I was in high school, I took this picture. And this picture was one of the very first pictures I took, and I was really interested in trying to show that there's um, something, as much going on, I wanted to frame her within a frame. And I wanted to always, and when I took f photographs afterwards, I was always looking at images within images. And there's always a frame within the frames, as I, as, as I look back at my early photographs. And that idea of framing was something that I could not get away, get away from because I was so fascinated with the manipulation of photography. And so I wanted to push that further and I'd ask my classmates and when I got to college to, to work with frames and then I'd go out into the, the public and I'd give people frames and ask them to take a picture and I'd take a picture of them taking a picture and it became this collaboration with the public and some of them uh, were kind of, they were, it was actually fascinating to, to just be out in the world in this way. And it helped me to become a better person because I realized the beauty of interaction, but also the beauty of chance. And one of the ways that that, that plays in is in images like this, where my mother, I asked her to take a picture and I gave her uh, a frame. And in her, what I thought, laziness, she just put the frame over her shoulder. But in the 15th of a second that she took a picture, she, she put the frame up there, someone was walking through the busy streets of New York, looked into a dark restaurant, and a woman wearing a red hat like my mom looked into, the, the, into my camera. And there's so many things that had to go right to make that image work that it really kind of called into question all the things I understood about kind of ways to read and understand photography. Um, and then, uh, so, and, and I graduated from NYU in 1998 and, and with a degree in photography and Africana studies. Three years later, my mother was hired by the Departments of Photography and Africana Studies, and she's the chair of the photo department now, and so I like to say I paid the way for her. Um, <laughs> and this is a piece that we get, did called Sometimes I See Myself in You, and it's really about this way in which uh, she says, uh, I used to be Deb's son, and now she's Hank's mom. And, and this kind of amazing, and my father doesn't like it because now he's called Mr. Willis, which is not his last name. <laughs> but. Um, 
but we all have to make adjustments. And, and thinking about that, there's a, a book called um, Everything But the Burden, and in it there's an essay by Carl Hancock Rux, and he writes uh, about Eminem, the white Negro. And in the essay, he says, there's something called black in America, and there's something called white in America, and I know them when I see them, but I will forever be unable to explain the meaning of them because they're not real, even though they have a very real place in my daily way of seeing a fundamental relationship in my ever-evolving understanding of history and a critical place in my relationship to humanity. And I often think that if I ever, I've, I've been known to appropriate, and if I could ever appropriate an artist statement, this would be it. Because I realize as I've traveled all over the world how uh, the, the challenges of seeing things, especially in the United States, so much in these terms of black and white, this binary that doesn't exist since no one's skin is actually black and no one's skin is actually white, and also that most people in the world aren't black or white, they're Asian, and that there's this kind of ignorance of kind of the reality of most human experience in the way that we talk about things. But I also think about these kind of shifting kind of ways in which, even in the United States, blackness and whiteness comes up in, in popular culture and media images. And I find images like this from earlier in our, in our history, in, in the early part of the 20th century, this was the most famous African-American entertainer of his time. Anybody know who that is? Does that strike you as absurd? Um, this is Burt Williams. And what I found so fascinating was the way that he was celebrated and made wealthy um, for performing authentic blackness and the way that he chose to pre present authentic blackness when he was uh, in his real life. And I start to really think about kind of who's getting paid to do what and, and how the frame of blackness is often informed, not, not by the quote unquote black experience, but also how sta this was the status quo when I was growing up and how kind of over time things shift and we sometimes <laughs> don't even really notice. Um, but, and and I, so I think of popular culture as this kind of amazing opportunity to look at uh, the then and the now. And I think about um, sports and entertainment, but I also think about logos as, as our centuries, our generation's hieroglyphs, and thinking about how uh, people who were celebrated for one thing at one time, how they might have been treated at a different period of time. And I started to think about how advertising is this powerful and ubiquitous language, and it's only used to do one thing. It's the most useful language in the world. We, you don't even have to speak the language to understand the ad, and it's only ever used to sell a product. And I'm interested in trying to to talk about ideas and thinking about how slaves were branded as a sign of ownership. And now today we brand ourselves, or we live in an age of branded consciousness. And thinking about how the idea of ascending for so many people is chained to uh, ascending through sports and entertainment. And, and how uh, maybe bodies are celebrated for hanging um, their, their hang time, so to speak, um, in, in one way would have been treated at a different period of time. or even in college sports, which is a multi-billion dollar industry that's ironically fueled off the free labor of descendants of slaves, and often playing on, this, working, playing on the same, working on the same fields that their ancestors harvested for generations. And how could I talk about um, these things with a level of complexity, talking about how even in uh, mourning, this is a picture from my cousin's funeral, but even in mourning, we're being marketed to with uh, like having to buy the right casket. And there's this kind of unspoken thing of if you buy the $2,000 casket, you couldn't afford to love them enough. If you buy the $7,000 casket, um, you know, that, 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 that says something about how much you love them. And, and my family at the time, you know, we couldn't afford to pay for anything. And either way, it was going to have to go on a credit card. And I thought that was a different comment on this notion of uh, priceless, of MasterCard prices campaign, but also um, how um, the diversity of, of, of Africa, which is a huge continent with hundreds of millions of people, with thousands of languages, thousands of cultures and worldviews, and how um, through the, I think of race as the su most successful advertising campaign of all time, because basically you took this diverse group of people in this diverse land, diverse land and kind of packaged them into ships, kidnapped them, packaged them in ships, and sent them halfway across the world, and then 500 years later, their ancestors are still trying to figure, it. they sent them halfway across the world and told them they were all the same. And that's, if you go to Africa today, people in different countries or cultures don't see themselves as similar. So how is it that we're all the same once we get here? And I think this idea of a creation of a quote unquote black race um, is, 
that we've all bought into is what I think of as absolute power. And I think about kind of the origins of that with um, the door of no return and Gory Island and Senegal and how I could talk about that. But also, as an African American, I'm often asked where I come from and saying I'm from New York isn't enough. And then saying I'm from Virginia or South Carolina before that isn't enough. And so I created a piece called The Place to Call Home, Africa, America. And wanting to talk about this kind of hybridity that exists within me, I, I look at myself, but I also look at art, other artists like Sanford Biggers, who was here not too long ago, and who has dealt with hybridity in a number of his works. But I wanted to talk about how uh, what's on the surface is very, says very little about who we are. And I wanted to, to deal with that through works like this, which is called Crossroads, where when you're looking at it from the front, it's blurry, and then from the side, it becomes clear. And the idea is that as uh, a viewer, you have to negotiate the piece. You have to walk around it and put yourself in motion to understand it and start to really think about how I could talk about um, multiple points of view in one work. So in works like this, where I says, it could have been me, it should have been you, or, or as you walk past this one, which says, it's all your fault, and then it's all my fault. I'm really interested in, in constantly trying to figure out, to talk about things that are, seem simple on the surface in a much more complicated way. And thinking about that, I, I came across this image taken by Ernest Withers in 1968, just eight years before I was born. And I found it fascinating um, that it was necessary for people just eight years before I was born to stand together and affirm their humanity. Because the phrase I grew up with wasn't I am a, a man, it was I am the man. And I thought it was really interesting how it went from a more uh, kind of collective statement during segregation to a more uh, selfish statement, actually, after integration. And I wanted to ponder that, and I decided to remix that in any number of ways in a series of paintings. And I lo always love to read the last line as a poem where it says, I'm the man, who's the man, you the man, what a man, I am man, I'm human, I'm many, I am, am I, I am, I am, I am a man. Because I've realized, um, and we've seen, especially with the, the millennial generation, but through that um, there are so many people, or even thinking about Stephen Hawking, who just through the, their ability to acknowledge their consciousness, they have been able to change the world. And this notion of validating yourself on anyone else's standards uh, of what's important is, 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 really, is really unnecessary. And, I, and, I, and so the thing that I always come back to is that my greatest gift is my consciousness. And thinking about that, I, I think about this person who, um, who, who made his name with another statement saying, I am somebody, and the power of affirmation, uh, especially within the African American community, has been super important because we've been so often devalued as human beings. And I thought about, uh, I found this pen. I've been interested in political pens because pens and, are so kitsch. You're like, how many people wear pens today? And it say, they say so much about, <laughs> don't mess with Mira, uh, they say so much about um, what we really believe in. And I think today we're so afraid to actually put something on our body that says something that seems, uh, that, that really exposes us. And I wanted to, to really do that in this work. And so I made, but I, I felt like I could turn them into sculptures and maybe put them in an art context and people can talk about them in a much more uh, thoughtful way. And so this is a pen. Um, does anybody know who the, who the greatest is? Who's the greatest? Now, I find that so fascinating that someone who we actually saw deteriorate before our eyes, uh, but was also born in the segregated South, um, not, you know, with very little means, was able to define themselves as the greatest. Not the greatest boxer, but the greatest of all time. And basically has impressed that into our minds for more than a half a, more than a, half a century. And I found that the absurdity of that was, was what I wanted to speak to. So I made this kind of a ridiculous kind of replica of this absurd object. And so on the back of it is a pen. And I wanted to like really think about these pens as something for more, more than they are and think about them as collectibles, but also as statements that really remind us of the, the struggles that, that are going on today and that have gone on uh, for centuries. Uh, and thinking about struggle is, is really important in this moment because we've seen probably more political protest in the past two years than we've seen in most of the past two decades. And I wanted to look at kind of how ways history might repeat itself. 
and look at the ways that protesters have been treated, but also seen as who is seen as a threat. This is an image from Life magazine in 1965 uh, um, after the Watts riots, and I found that so amazing that, it, that these people, the, the t caption said, two little prisoners. This was, uh, uh, these people were considered a threat to the, to, to, to the public. And thinking about if these people were considered threats, how were people we see today that um, African American men who are much older are, are, have also been uh, treated as threats when they couldn't possibly have been posing one. But also thinking about what happens when people use their voices to speak up for equality and against injustice. I look at images and try to find new ways to present them. And so this is an image from apartheid South Africa where this person was sing, sending a gesture to, uh, to the world. This person being arrested and maybe never to be seen again wanted to put his arm through the breathing hole to, to tell people that, uh, to believe and to, to have, have strength. And I wanted to, to, to make that something that I could relate to in a three-dimensional way. And so I made this a sculpture, a mandala, where you actually uh, get to kind of almost be in relationship to this historical moment. And I'm cutting it out, I'm cropping it the same way the photographs are cropping, but also trying to encourage us to think more about the surrealness of, of the moments and the necessity for these gestures, like in South Africa, where they needed to burn their past books because uh, they wanted to be uh, have freedom of free, free, be free to move around, and the idea of collectively um, protesting when one could get put in jail for five years for uh, being caught without their passbook, I thought was um, amazing, and, and I wanted to kind of crystallize that moment and, and in, invite 21st century viewers to engage with that. Or images like this one from Ernest Cole of miners being strip searched. Um, how I could. I always felt guilty looking at this image because I, I'm constantly looking and gawking at their butts. And I, I, I was thinking, is there an appropriate way to represent this image? And I decided to represent it, cropping it this way, and I titled it Raise Up, not knowing that just six months after I created it, there would be these amazing uh, protests after Michael Brown's murder uh, that this gesture became the, the ultimate symbol of it. And, and I, I thought that the way in which you can reframe something and all of a sudden give it a new potency, a new meaning, is really what I'm most interested in in my work. And thinking about how uh, images like this one from um, Auschwitz, where these children were um, um, obviously living behind barbed wire, but the hard part for me was to think about what that means. And it seems so crazy until I looked at it as the sculptural work and I realized that there's children all over the world who are living in very, very similar conditions. And, and, it, it, and it's not as far removed as I'd like it to be. But also thinking about um, images of where protest kind of has transformed into new areas and uh, the connection between uh, two different cultures or two different um, political systems with uh, Germany, when the wall comes down, I, I created this piece um, where it really starts to echo um, the creation image, and, and it, it speaks to this connection. And I love how these quote unquote white hands become black hands, or, the, or bronze hands in different works. Or, and even thinking about sports as a metaphor for um, political uh, movements, um, and, and the Harlem Globetrotters' role in that, and this, this photograph. Uh, I wanted to think about liberty in a new way and how sports is often seen as an opportunity to overcome both personal struggles and collective struggles and, and was really excited to, in, to have the sculpture and actually show it recently. It's uh, just opened just two days ago in City Hall Park. And, uh, and, I, and I love how the changing context um, allows us to engage with uh, age-old ideas in new ways. And thinking about that, I. I come to images like this, uh, which are advertised, it was an advertisement. And I really think of advertising as a form of social conditioning, a form of brainwashing. Uh, anybody know what this is an ad for? Shoes? The Reebok, does anybody see any shoes in this ad? Does anybody see the word Reebok in this Reebok ad? We see three letters, RBK, and I, found, I realized that we've reached a moment where it's completely unnecessary to actually have the product in the ad, because ads are really about selling the idea. And 
in this one, I guess we see 50 Cent, who's a rapper, and the text is, I am what I am, and what I guess is suggestion that he's a criminal at the end of the day. Uh, and then, and, and I found this image striking because I was like, how, what choices does this give, what message does this send to the youth of our, of our generation? And I wanted to go online and see what other images were being produced. And there was this one of Andy Ruddock, uh, and he says, I am what I am, and he's a champion. And, and then there was uh, one of Lucy Liu, who's, uh, a, I guess, a, a little girl. And then uh, Yao Ming is a, a monkey on a basketball. And uh, Allen Iverson was the devil. Uh, and then uh, Jay-Z says, I got my MBA at Marcy Projects. So, he, so he's, I guess he's talking about being a, a drug dealer. And I found that to be like kind of amazing that this was, these ads are, are reflection of a society's hopes and dreams at a given period of time. They are publicly sanctioned things. And the fact that you can now sell a product that ha with people who have nothing to do with the product, actually not even have the product in it, was so amazing. And African-American men who are 5% of the population are represented three times in the first iteration of this. So one, and you have one black man who's, I guess, a criminal, and then the, the even though he's a multimillionaire, and, and you have the one white man who's uh, a champion, although he does feel bad about it, and then the, uh, which is the white male burden, and then you have the Asian-American woman who is like this docile, innocent kind of, uh, thoughtless being, and then you have the uh, Chinese giant who's something we clearly don't know what to do with, um, and then the other African-American man's the devil, and the other one is, is a drug dealer. And what, you know, what is really for sale here? And someone gave me this ad, which was for a 2001 Toyota RAV4, and they were like, you should do something with this. And I was like, I don't know what to do with this. Um, and I, after four years of looking at it, the only thing I could think of was this. And <laughs> I realized that the last thing that you would think this was an ad for was Japanese cars. And so I really started to think about what would happen if I looked at images and started to remove the advertising information and maybe look at what's really being sold. And so I started this project. Um, I actually met Don and Mira Rubel at uh, a party, and they were asking me what I was working on. And I started this series, and I'd had like 10 of them. And they were like, how many are you going to make? And I was like, um, I don't know. I was like, well, they're like, well, we want to buy it. I was like, okay, 80? <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> they were like, okay. And I was like, I, I guess now I have to finish this project. Um, and so I started, uh, really out of that conversation is this project became Unbranded Reflections in Black by Corporate America from 1968 to 2008. And I thought 1968 would be like 40 years because it was a symbolic end of the civil rights movement when um, Martin Luther King and RFK, RFK were assassinated. And then I thought 40 years later would just be an interesting time. But then it wound up being bookended by the election of Barack Obama. And so all of a sudden, this project started to really um, track blackness in, in the corporate eye over the course of this, cent this last part of the 20th century. And I find I meant to like ask you a question, but like, what do you think this is an ad for? It's an ad for the pants. And it said, Slack Power, the anti-establishment, post-grads, Slacks by his. So as early as 1969, they were appropriating the language of the MasterCard, of, of the Black Power movement to, to sell what looked like golf pants to me, to like the educated revolutionary. Um, or images like this one, which, um, anybody want to guess what this is an ad for? Some people got it. Margarine, who's, who's in the image? It's Joe Frazier, heavyweight boxing champion, one of the few images of, uh, of African-American male kind of prowess of his generation. And when you see it, on, you know, it's actually an ad for margarine. And all of a sudden, you start to realize kind of what happens, what else was going on in the boardroom when they're making these decisions. Or, and I think it's interesting to look at real ads because no one person is responsible for them. We as like a people, in a sense, are. What it, this is an ad from 2005 that I found in Ebony Magazine. What do you think this is an ad for? Anybody? Ice cream order? It's actually an ad for kitty litter. <laughs> and you might ask yourself how it find its way into Ebony Magazine. And, and, and I guess there's that stereotype about black people liking watermelon. And, there, and someone was probably in the boardroom like, well, how do we get black people to buy our kitty litter? Well, black people like watermelon. And what would make watermelon more civilized is all the seeds are in place and you can scoop them away, just like our kitty litter. Like, that's the only real logic 
And it's similar with the Japanese, like how do you get black people to buy our car? Well, if you put, a, black people like gold teeth, and if you put a car on our gold tooth, maybe. There's these kind of ways in which, and, and I, I find these things in these images that, that tell so much about our society. This is an image from 1967, which literally could not have existed just 10 years earlier. 1977, that could not have existed in 1967, where you have a black man and a white man eating at a lunch counter, and the white man is looking longingly at his dark meat, <laughs> um, which is part of the byproduct of you know, the black power movement, black exploitation uh, films. And you see these dramatic shifts that, that speak to things. Some people aren't sure why they're drinking so much milk. That's a whole other story. <laughs> but they, they, you see these things, and they, they, they tell us, I think you can learn more about a society through looking at a series of images that, of ads than you could from reading a whole book around the same era. Or images like this one where you see uh, this is, I guess, the best way to smoke a cigarette is to have right in front of a fan so you can have the smoke like r blow back into your face because <laughs> Salem cigarettes is the refreshing kind of cigarette. And that's and, and, and all of the kind of ways in which we're asked to kind of decode all of these stories in these images. And we do it so fast without thinking about it. Where this one, where it's an ad from 1979 where the people in it just, quote unquote, happen to be black. It's, uh, I think it's because African Americans are moving more into the middle class. I don't need to ask anyone in the room what it's an ad for because we've been conditioned to know immediately. But what I find so fascinating is uh, even as kind of we see certain kind of progress, we see the, the men play as the women watch. And, uh, the, the, as, and the woman on the left is like uh, feeding this guy this burger. But if you look at his right hand, he's got his own burger down there. <laughs> So you can almost like imagine the photographer being like, oh, you need something to do, feed him. And I'm always fascinated with kind of this way in which progress is, the road to progress is always under construction. And thinking about how even images that are meant to celebrate, like this one from uh, a 2001 ad for Chevy trucks, which is obvious, um, but it was Black History Month. And they were like, you know, uh, once upon a time there were, in America, there were people who were proud and strong, et cetera. And basically, uh, I guess they wanted to tell this black history. And they have the African chief, Griot, and the soldier, and the, civil, and, and the jazz musician, and the civil rights activist, and the college graduate. And I realized that there was somebody missing in this kind of timeline of black history. Because you couldn't really sell the heartbeat of America with an image of a beat up bloody slave in the middle of it. So, so I, I retitled it, Once Upon a Time in America, There Were No Slaves. Because e so, even in our celebration within the corporate lens, there is ways in which you have to negate the, the reality of the story. And I, so I was so happy when I first got to see the entire series at the Rubel Family Collection um, in 2008. And you are walking through an element, a moment of American history and, and, and when you look at this series. And thinking about this present moment, I, wanted to th I was really thinking about um, 100 years ago and what images were being produced 100 years ago. Because 100 years ago in the US, um, no women had the right to vote. And not only did, but African Americans technically, have, African American men technically had the right to vote, all, although everything was do, done to make sure they didn't. Um, there was this movement for women in the, for women, but especially, I think, in the context, white women, to, to have the right to vote. And it was not taken so easily. And I was really, I wanted to look at the images that our society was making at that time and thinking about the, the parallels to the ways that kind of African Americans were treated when they, and as they, continue to ask for equal treatment, the ways in which, uh, quote unquote, white women who are often seen as the most precious women and children first in our society uh, were treated when asking to have equal rights. And that, that the way that society responded with these fears of the women making the men do, the, do, do their work and how horrible that could be, but also, as you see, like this, this really vicious violence. And I wanted to look at uh, these ideas of election day. And, and so what, and as we start to think about the possibility of having our first female elected president, you know, just shy of 100 years of women getting the right to vote, how, why did it take so long for half of the population to get this far. And I wanted to look at how advertising plays into that as, 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 as a medium. And so I was looking at images of today and the ways in which uh, race and gender play into that, 
the complexities of these images. And so I started a new project called uh, Unbranded a Century of White Women from 1915 to 2015. And in it, I wanted to really explore the creation of uh, a white race and the necess necessity of that in popular culture because uh, most people who are considered white today would not have been considered white 100 years ago. Jewish people, Italian people, Russian people, uh, Spanish people, you, you, I, Armenians, etc. And I think of whiteness as this amazing blob where people kind of move into it. And it's really about opportunity and this way, and, and opportunity against those who don't have it. But I also wanted to look at how notions of female um, identity, I'm speaking slow because I'm really loopy because I'm, <laughs> I'm having altitude craziness. So if I don't say anything to sound smart, I'm going to blame it on that later. Um, <laughs> But I wanted to look at images that they were being created and what was a woman's place then. So images like this one, what do you guys think this is an ad for? Anybody want to guess? It is an ad for stockings. But what's, what I found so fascinating that it's like right up, so it starts off, you know, looking at different things, but this is World War I. And the way in which, I guess, it's celebrating the way that your husband's come back from the war, he's shell-shocked and injured, and part of the thing that you can do is, I guess, to, to make him feel better is to l look good. And I'm interested in the ways in which the notions of kind of virtue were kind of created and, and played upon in contrast to others in images that were made in popular culture, especially thinking about immigrants that were coming to the US with very little opportunity at all, but needing something to aspire to. And you could always aspire to be higher than others. And the ways that plays into images like this, which are for, which was for, um, for star cotton starch. So the signifier in that is the African-American woman. But the idea is that you, as a white woman, don't have to do any work. You just can like sit back and, and relax and just make sure you buy the product, and, and she's happy to do the work. But also, I start to, the, the series is 100 images, 101 images, for, one for every year. And you see, and as you, walk, as you go through the series, you see so many things about um, the creation of, of a beauty industry and the, the technology of beauty. This is for an eye cream and this idea of cr having crow's feet. And, and, and the, and, or, or an image like this one from 1932, which is after the stock market crash. What do you guys think this is an ad for? It, it's actually an ad for, it says, uh, for floor wax. And she's, I'm beginning to look like an old scrub woman. And the idea is that like now after the, 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 you know, the, the economy's not booming anymore, people are going to have to do their own work, and therefore, that's the end of the world. And so you don't want to ever be seen as doing your own work. And the ways in which that plays, played into so many of the ads about like who would be performing what roles. And notice, noticeably, most of the people in these ads are not African Americans. They're people performing African American role as this kind of noble savage, or even in the, the Pacific Islands, this is for dull pineapple juice. And as you go through, uh, the, the, the century, you start to see when world elements play into World War II, where we see uh, now uh, at the, in the home front, the woman's protecting the husband, or an image like this one, which I think is one of the most amazing ones. Um, it's actually an ad for ice. <laughs> and it says, women and carrots have one enemy in common, and that enemy is dryness. And the idea was, you know, this is... During the, the, the war is starting, everyone's thinking and talking about these issues. And the way that that plays out is in this anxiety. And I guess I can talk about every image for so long. But now the women who weren't supposed to do any work at one point, because the men are off at war, are, are not only doing the work, but they're proud to be doing the work. And the men are cheering them as they do the work until they come back and they want their jobs back. And the women go back to the place where they're expected to be. And I start to really realize the way that advertising has been used and continues to be used to shape our notions about who we are, where we belong to society, and where others belong in, con in contrast and relationship to us. Like this ad from 1949, what do you guess this is for? It's obviously an ad for Budweiser. <laughs> and what's so amazing about it is that you think about like, so again, you have the African-American drawing as, as a signifier, and I guess in the good old days, you'd have your slave offer somebody some ham, and today you could offer somebody a bud. <laughs> but at the same time that uh, uh, after World War II, uh, African Americans and 
women were fighting, starting to kind of actually ask for more and to, to kind of fight for equality. And so ways that plays out is in the, this ad for a frost-free refrigerator where she's freed from the refrigerator or, or she's like now, but now she's at work and she's caught up in a poor system. So she's like in, in a straight jacket. This one says, I, I dreamed I, I won election. I, I dreamt I won the election in my maiden form bra. Uh, so, so, so there's this, this kind of tug of war of like this, this the, but also the images I notice become much more sexual and much more um, kind of in many ways violent towards women as at the same time that feminism starts to kind of get, get its stride. This is an ad that says, uh, drag her out of the bone age. It's for, um, it's for a girdle, right? A, a corset. And, and like, this is an image taken the same moment that Emmett Till was killed for whistling at a white woman. And this was not a controversial image. And I find it so, the, the hypocrisy to be amazing. And I literally could talk about this project nonstop, and I'm sorry I'm rushing through it. But there are, I'm fascinated that with the messages that the images are sending because we're, we're buying these images today. This is an ad from 1960. Uh, and again, you'll never guess what it's for. It's for the sweaters, but the, 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 the line, men are better than women. Indoors, women's, uh, women are useful, even pleasant but on a mountain there's somewhat of a drag. So don't go hauling your wife up the side of a cliff to show off her, your new drum and sweater. And so, but what's happening is like, women are asking to be on level playing ground and the men are saying, well, well I, it's up to us whether or not we decide to let you go or, or pull you up. And I'm really fascinated with the way that, that played up and the violence becomes more and more brutal in the 60s, even as there's certain strides of like, okay, her time in the kitchen has gotten less, but then she's in chains or she's in a cage. And at the, the same physical violence that was being brought on African Americans and at that same time was psychologically being played out again on quote unquote white women. And it is incredibly violent. And as we move through, the, through, through that, that period, we start to see kind of the, the, as women move into the boardrooms, we start to see some kind of fighting back visually, but also uh, the battles that may have been lost. Um, and then, uh, but the 1972, Shirley Tr Chisholm's running for president. No coincidence that this becomes a, a, an ad for, for actual cigarettes. But so, and so the project really is going through this generation. You see the major shifts again in 1984 when Geraldine Ferraro is running for vice president. You see a shift in images from popular culture. Hillary Clinton comes on the scene. You see something new. These, there, but then there's all of these other images that perpetuate that, you know, this is an ad that says, can you find the Miller Lite in this picture? By the way, it tastes great. <laughs> so this, these women are fully in service of the bottle. And the, kind of, and the, the uniformity the, of the way the standard of beauty has been so kind of policed um, in so many ways. And, and, and I'm really interested in kind of investigating that, but also how even in the, this is from 1999, images that are produced to sell, I guess, jeans are incredibly problematic. Um, and, and this idea of a successful life, I don't even know how to decode this image. And so I really wanted to like, look at these images and put them out there so that we can have the conversation about what is it that we're buying into when we buy these products and for, and for what reason. And so I see myself often as a visual culture archeologist where I'm looking at the images that we're producing and asking us to think twice about them. But this is an image from 2008 that literally could not have existed 10 years before. This is again Hillary Clinton's influence as she's running for president as a scrappy woman, and there becomes this new notion of what a, a female's role can be. But also we see these shifts in where a black woman's role in relationship to the white woman can be. But, and so what's one of the things that I've noticed ha over the course of the period is that no longer easy to create a, a monolithic demographic of a quote unquote white woman. And so you have same sex couples and all of these other changes. But miraculously, it kind of all came back to zero um, in 2015 and this ad for uh, for a Ram truck. Um, and they're in pursuit of happiness. Uh, so, so I mean, I, I'd like to like open up for questions. And uh, but I do I want to end with one thing, which is hope and how the, how the importance of using our voices um, is essential. And the way that, that plays out is in a number of ways. So the Truth Booth being the project that you mentioned, uh, where I ask with my collaborators, Jim Ricks and Ryan Alexia, people to go in and ask people to tell the truth from their perspective. And we, we shot it, 
We took it to Ireland and had over a thousand people to participate inside the booth. We took it to South Africa. We've taken it to Afghanistan. And over the course of the past four years, we've had 5,000 people go in and, and offer their truths. And it's a really humbling experience to see people uh, offer their generosity and, their, and show and express their, their diversity and complexity and notions of the truth in a variety of ways. And I'll just show a, a moment of one of my favorite clips here. The truth is not to be discovered because it was there before we were born. It hid itself when we were born and it only comes out again once we are dead. I'm nearly dead, so the truth will shortly emerge. I just thought that was so kind of eloquent and, and amazing. So thank you guys for your time. And uh, if you have any questions, please do ask. Go ahead. Play that in the right. background. <laughs> well, I'll start, Hank. So you said that your greatest gift is your consciousness. And I know that you have some wonderful things going on in New York, where you're from, uh, including the, you have a role on the Cultural Commission. Is that, is the, that right? The Art Commission. Art yeah. Commission. Mm -hmm. So now you have a chance to influence things from the inside. You've been commenting from the outside. And I just wanted to know what sorts of things you're thinking or planning or doing there. Well, so it's now called the Public Design Commission, and we basically uh, hold sway over every building, every structure built on city property. So it's not only art, it's like buildings. And I'm just learning at the moment, just what it, realizing how civic, civic business works. And I'm really fascinated um, with the level of thought that goes into trying to create a healthier place for, uh, for the citizens of any city. And I, I, don't, I don't even know where to begin, actually. So, does anyone else have any questions? Thank you for a wonderful talk. Thank you. Um, my question is, uh, in creating your work of um, 100 years of white women, did you have any trouble with advertising companies or with copyright laws or with the, um, the companies that you you use their ads. Did you have any trouble with that? At no, all? I've, using the, the images. I've never had any trouble with any of the uh, advertisers. I've always my concern has always been more about the the photographers than it is the advertisers. Uh, I because because for, for certain photographers, I feel like it can be seen as their art, but often it's just a job. And I but I'm really the con the work is a dare. I'm trying to I dare any corporation to actually have a conversation about the images that they're producing and what they really mean. And because I think it's really helpful and useful for all of us to do that. And so um, I, the work is really about building conversation and, and about building dialogue. This is a piece about community. And I'm really interested in how we can all use our voices, use our, our faces to be present and actually to, to, to engage. And so it's not only the corporations speaking to us, but it's us speaking back to the corporations that affect our lives so much. And Mira has a question. Hank, I, ha I don't have a question, but I have a thank you. Because if it wasn't for you, there would never have been, we would have never, never, never done the 30 Americans. That was 2005, when we had a conversation on a, in a hotel on the beach doing Kahinde Wiley's uh, um, fish fry, yeah. fish that he caught. <laughs> and we had asked you what you thought about putting together all the African-American artists in our collection in a exhibition format. And you said, God, I'm gonna have to think about this, but let's have a conversation, let's continue this conversation. And that conversation took place for like a, f a few years until you continuously, you, know, you didn't say no, but you said, let's, let's weigh it, let's think about it. And ultimately, it was really your encouragement that, met, that made that happen. And now 30 Americans has been seen by a million people. And in every one of these, venues, you've tried to be there for them, and they are so grateful, like the oh, Cochrane, you, yeah. what you did, and all of that. Anyway, it's going to be at the Detroit Institute in October, and it continues to go. Thank you, thanks to you, because you were the first one to encourage us to do it. Thank you so much. I think what's...
So 30 Americans is this uh, landmark exhibition uh, that the Rubel family decided to curate uh, based off their own collection um, to do something that no actual museum institution would ever have done, uh, which would to do a multi-generational exhibition of artists of African descent. Uh, and, it even, and, it, and it's really kind of amazing to think about that as a, as a, that being a courageous thing to do uh, because people are afraid about black artists being ghettoized, et cetera. And I, I, I really think that it's important to use all of the different lenses and all the different frames to, and also to use if an institution won't do it because they did it at their collection and then all of a sudden there's been eight or nine other museums that are like excited to do it and now there's people going to museums that have never been and, and, and it's creating an amazing dialogue now seven or eight years later and I think, I think everyone in this room has the opportunity whether you have the means through finances or through just having a mouth <laughs> or having a pen uh, to, 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 to use your voice to, to speak to not just one thing, but the multitude of things that you really care about. Question. Sorry. Thanks, oh, Craig. Oh, thanks for coming again, by the way. And I had a question about your, just your practice as an artist, because I think it's really interesting that you look at culture as an entity that can be diagnosed in a way. And the symptoms you look at are the photographs that get produced. And I think that you know, lots of other artists wouldn't have that strategy, it wouldn't occur to them. I was just wondering if you could just talk about that, if, if you wouldn't well, mind. Well, as I said, my, my interest in photography comes from my mother, and it comes from having pictures in my house of mostly people who I didn't know who they were, and most of them weren't famous. But I was aware that they weren't the kind of pictures that I was used to seeing um, on television, in magazines, and newspapers of African Americans. And I think uh, the fact that my mom could be, uh, as she would call it, a little black girl from North Philadelphia, um, and then go on to win a MacArthur and Guggenheim and so many other things, but really for just following her own interests and, and trying to uh, build a dialogue. The fact that one, any of us can create history, because history, are, history is our stories, you know, and the fact that if we only accept the dominant narrative, we're actually missing out on probably the most interesting part of what happened, and so I, uh, I struggle when I do a talk because I'm just like, Ugh. I don't, I know I'm not the best artist, but I do got a lot of work and a, and a, and a broad range of work, all of which I think is very interesting. <laughs> and, and it's hard because like, I, I, as an African American artist, you're often um, kind of marginalized with people expecting that I only care about this little thing, which is like, I, of course I care about African, Americans and African, the African experience. But of course, that's part of the global experience. It's not, it's, a, and, and you can never really separate the quote unquote black experience from the American experience. It's literally there, and that's the thing that I've been really trying to encourage people to pay more attention to that it's, we're all a part of this story. The thing that makes the United States unique is that you can come here and within five or 10 years be an American. And there's, you can go to almost any other country in the world besides Canada um, and try as you might to be a part of that culture, whether you look like them or not, you will always be seen as an outsider. And, and so I think um, what, the, what I love about being an American and being an artist in the United States is it gives me uh, the opportunity to kind of go outside what are the prescribed bounds of what I should do as a photographer, as an artist, et cetera. Thank you. So I think uh, you sort of, uh, I guess, addressed a little bit of my question in that um, as well. But Hank, it's been really a pleasure seeing. I've known your work for a long time, and it's great to hear you talk about it in the seamless way. I'm wondering if you can talk both about your experience uh, going to Cape Town and Johannesburg and thinking about building a body of work in South Africa, um, and sort of the transition, I guess, the the shift from from image based to sculptural work and. Um, yeah, and well, that, uh, well, going to South Africa is like the United States in the Twilight Zone. It's like the, visually the people who have the most power are still the same people here, but they're the extreme minority. And, and, and the, 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 the kind of conversation of like frontierism, which is, what, is why we're here, it's literally here, <laughs> but also that's, that's why people in South Africa, that's part of their, their narrative too and the ways in which uh, the native African populations kind of were treated in, which is different than the way the native American populations were treated, but the way that outside 
slaves were brought in from Malawi and other parts of Africa, just like another population was brought in to do slave labor here, and then, of course, segregation and apartheid. But South Africa gave me this amazing lesson. Um, it's because I went to South Africa in 2003, and there was uh, a place called the District 6 Museum where they talk about, um, we, that was like kind of the most multicultural part of uh, Cape Town, and there was a South Asian and European mixed person and uh, maybe China, black and a African and, and European mixed person, and they were talking about themselves as being part of the colored race. And because in South Africa, if you are neither quote unquote black or white, you are des designated as, as colored, and that's a totally different race. And I realized that, and then I started to meet colored people who look like me, and realizing that like, and white people that look like you, I mean colored people that look like you. And I realized that in England, you know, South Asian people are considered black. And, and all of a sudden, the notion of blackness and whiteness really seemed to be, if, I was like, if race is so empirical, how come it's so hard? How come these three major powers can't actually decide on what is actually black and what is actually white? And as I started to go more and more back to South Africa and realize how race has really always been used to kind of divide and conquer, um, I, I really wanted to start to draw parallels to that and to the political movements. And, and now that everyone has this, I used to think of myself as a photographer, but now that we are all photographers, because we all have a camera in our pocket, it, it, I no longer felt like what I could do was better than what anyone else could do. And so I wanted to start to really look at the images our societies were creating and tr again, try to like, you have all these stories in these boxes and these archives that no one ever goes to except historians. And, I want the public to really engage and to embrace these stories and, and, and so that if we see history repeating itself, we can actually call it what it is and actually hopefully make this different decisions. But I know a lot of you guys have to go back to class and I'll be here for a while, but thank you all and I look forward to seeing your work in the future. Well, Hank, Thank you so much for helping us frame up popular culture. And I can say, you are the man. Oh, thank you. <laughs>